You're listening to Be Kind Rewind, Rewind with Tim Nidell, taking you back to when movies were actually, actually good. good. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? When music wasn't auto tune, when TV only had a few channels. And now, here's your host, Tim Nidell. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Beacon Rewind with Tim Nidell. That's me. And uh, if you're watching the video of this, I just waved at you. And if you're listening, I still waved, but you can't see it. <laughs> yeah, there's many ways to uh, enjoy this podcast and the other podcasts on this channel. There is a YouTube channel. It's the Phoenix Media Pop Culture Entertainment Channel. Uh, just type that in, YouTube, and you'll find it. You can watch this video and many other videos that they have to offer on there. But if you're fine with just audio, then why stop doing just audio? I don't care how you enjoy the podcast as long as you're enjoying it, you know? I'm also going to be featuring this interview on my personal YouTube channel. Just type in Tim Nidell. That's N-Y-D-E-L-L. So make sure to give it a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And uh, while you're on the interweb, make sure to check out my personal website, timnidell.com. Follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube, like I said. I've even got merch on there because I'm a loser. I got my own merch, and I'm wearing my own merch because I'm a bigger loser. It says Nidell. It's very cool. Trust me. (laughs) So check that out, timnidell.com. I'd really appreciate it. And for this episode, I'm taking you all the way back. I just said all. I think I just said all. I'm taking us all the way back to the 80s, quite possibly my favorite decade of all time, because I have the very talented Catherine Mary Stewart on the podcast today. And of course, you know her from Night of the Comet, which is easily one of my all-time favorite, you know, guilty pleasures out there. Um, She's also on Last Starfighter, classic, classic movie from the 80s. And she was on Weekend at Bernie's, another classic from the 90s. And we talk about all that and more. And by more, I mean Knight Rider, because she did an episode of Knight Rider, and uh, that show was awesome. So uh, anyways, here is my interview with Catherine Mary Stewart. Tell me a little bit about yourself. What what kind of things were you interested in when you were younger? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I... I uh... I got to get into like the mind space of this thing because I've been running around all morning and then I'm late and I'm like, ah, and then rushing down here to this room. What was I interested in when I was younger? Well, um, I had two older brothers. So one of my main goals in life was to keep up with them, but they weren't that interested. They were always like, you know, um, I was the little girl. So it was always like the boys went off and did their own thing. I tried as hard as I could to follow, keep up with them but had trouble doing that. Um, I get, my family is pretty animated and um, sort of, I remember uh, friends would come over to our house and, and there was always somebody singing at the top of their lungs in, in my house of the kids, not, not necessarily my parents. Um, and they thought that was really strange. And I was like, that's perfectly normal in my house. So I was always surrounded by kind of this animated, lively, almost a performance like um, singing and just, you know, always the conversations at the dinner table were very animated. And um, I, you know, my dad, I come from a very academic family, but I watched a lecture of my dad's one time and I'm like, I see where I get it from (laughs) because he was a a big performer when he was, uh, you know, lecturing. And uh, so, uh, and I used to love as a, as a kid, like if I was alone in the house after school, just putting on a record when there were just, just records at that yeah. time. And I memorized every song on the album and would sing it at the top of my lungs. You know, um, I remember when I was really young on Sundays, we would always have a Sunday brunch and um, like every, every Sunday, um, my mother would make pancakes or waffles or some or French toast or something like that. And it would always be like around 10 or 11. And my dad would put music on in the living room when we could hear it as we were eating. And one day he put on the Beatles and we were just like, what, what the heck? 
<laughs> because up to that time, it was folk music and, you know, yeah. Burl Ives and um, things that but like uh, that nature or classical music. And all of a sudden, uh, Rubber Soul was playing. And so that was my sort of introduction into rock and roll. It was yeah. pretty harmless soft rock and roll. But oh boy, I got my hands on that record and, and <laughs> literally memorized every song on that. And of course, from there, I became a huge Beatles fan. So music was always a huge part of my life. Um, art, my dad is an incredible artist. Um, my mother, I, you know, like I said, I came from this academic background and um, I, to, my brothers were both honor students and all this other stuff. And I was literally like, yeah, I hate school. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like to think it's because I was bored. I was so smart that I was bored. <laughs> That's debatable. Um, but my mother kept introducing me to new things like when I was very young ballet, which I hated because it was too regimented and bored. I found it so boring. And then um, gymnastics. And at one point she had me taking an art class with, um, you know, oil painting and and I I enjoyed it. it was okay but but uh I really found my niche when I was about 14 my mother kind of tricked me into going to this uh dance class this jazz dance class that um was opening up in my hometown and um I was so mad at her I was like I hate dance I did the ballet thing uh and somehow she got me to go and I said, well, I'll do one class, but then I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> and I get into this class and I just, it just felt like home to me. And, and also it helped that, that the uh, dance teacher was very super cool. And she, she played all this really funky seventies, very hip music. Um, so it made it much more appealing, but I, I just, felt like yes this is what, what i what kind of dance so, was it what kind of dance was it it was jazz dance sort of oh. modern jazz yeah um yeah so that became my passion for until i graduated from high school and then i decided to pursue it and i ended up in london um at a, a performing arts school uh where dance was sort of the prevalent thing but um we also took acting classes and singing classes and every kind of performing arts classes you can think of. Um, so, you know, kind of unintentionally, I sort of created this wonderful foundation for myself, <laughs> which served me well, you know, later on. So, it, and that's when you kind of chose, I guess, acting over your first love of, of dance. Is that right? Well, the, yes, but that was by chance because I was in London and, um, the, the person who ran the dance school that I went to for all those years, who also created a, a dance company called Synergy. And we, we toured throughout Canada and throughout Europe and the Middle East. We were a professional dance company. Um, she, when I, she knew I was going off to London, she said, you know, uh, just take advantage of every situation that you can if any auditions come up or anything like that. So I found out about this uh, dance audition for a movie. It was a rock musical. I thought, I'll, I'll just go to this audition because I've never been to one of these kind of cattle call auditions. Mm -hmm. um, so I went along to that and the, the director kind of pulled me out of the group and asked me if I could act. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> so he had me read for the lead role of this movie and I ended up getting it. So that was kind of my bizarro transition into acting. Wow. And I did this movie and, um, um, you know, really it, it sort of what served me well was, was I didn't have this dramatic intention and need to become some actress. I was like, this is cool. I'm gonna go with this flow now. And, uh, much to my surprise, you know, getting a lead role in a feature film gives you a lot of cred. And um, it's kind of snowballed from there. I, uh, and I eventually ended up in LA. And uh, that's when I started really taking it seriously. Yeah. Um, I thought, okay, this is something I'm really going to go for. Wow. I mean, look at you just that right, isn't that weird? Right, right place, right time. 
Right. I know. I mean, that's part of this business though. You know, it's like being in the right place at the right time. It's so much luck involved. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, it, it, it's tough that way because it's great to have incredible talent, but there's so much more. And especially nowadays, it's really um, such a personal business. You know, there's so much you can do on your own with the internet and, and, and all that other stuff. Absolutely. And you really need to get involved in that end of things. Yeah. But for me, getting into the business, it was just a whole lot of luck. And, <laughs> and being in a place where I was, I was kind of allowing that the situation to unfold you know some people might have been too nervous or whatever i was young i was naive and i was like cool i'll do that now so <laughs> i was lucky i was lucky that way i was going through your imdb earlier and i saw you're on nighthawks with sylvester stallone in 1981 so that would have been like That's super early in your career then it was. It was after I'd done the first movie I did was called The Apple. And um, I w from The Apple, it was around Christmas time. So I went home for Christmas. I ended up doing another movie in Canada while I was home locally, like in Edmonton. A friend of mine was a casting director, a local casting director. And she cast me in this movie um, called Powderheads, which was a ski comedy, pretty weird movie. <laughs> um but then I, I went back to, to London because I kind of acquired an agent there, a theatrical agent. And, and I also wanted to go back to dance and see what would happen. You know, just I want, I'd sort of established myself in London, put it that way. So I went back to London and I had this audition with Sylvester Stallone. Wow. Uh, at that point, it was of Rocky fame. And there was a, a few girls who were all sort of <laughs> standing there going, oh, my God. <laughs> Anyway, I ended up getting this little role in Nighthawks. I think it's fairly early on in, in the movie. Um, it's, it's in London. I play this um, sort of perfume sales girl in this department store. And Rutger Hauer comes up and sort of is kind of very seductively asking me about perfumes as he's shoving a bomb under my counter. And so uh, it's a small role. I, I die early, <laughs> but because I'm, but it, get, it, it, it makes him look so evil because I'm so young and innocent. And oh my gosh, Rutger Hauer scared the crap out of me <laughs> because, you know, I was new in this acting thing and I was like, this man really hates me and I'm scared of him. <laughs> Because he stayed in character. So he's a method and, actor then, okay. Uh, I guess I I I didn't say three words to him except the dialogue because uh. he scared the crap out of me. And also <laughs> he wasn't like, so my name's Rutger, you know? Yeah, it was yeah. just like, he came in, he did his role and then he left and I was just like, oh, wow. holy <laughs> shit, what was that? <laughs> I was so young and, and now you, you know, and, um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience. I had talked to Sly a little bit, you know, he was interesting, an interesting character, but it was fun. Yeah. That's awesome. And then I recently uh, mm -hmm. rewatched your episode of Knight Rider because. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. How did you find that? It Where is, was that? It was on, it wasn't Hulu. I just typed it on Roku TV. I just typed in Knight Rider and it oh, gave me all the options of to watch it. And one of them was a free way to watch it. I don't remember. I think it was just the NBC app. And not Peacock, oh. but just NBC. Okay. Yeah. So every I haven't there. seen that. Yeah, it's forever. on there. It's on there. I can send you okay. a link. I gotta, I've got to find that one. <laughs> yeah, send me the link. Yeah, Dude, send you, because I'll send you the link. I believe well, that may have been my second job in LA. Wow. Um, the, yeah. Uh, the first one was called, what was it called? You've got my IMDB up there. Do you have it was a show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that my character was named Daisy. And it was yes. Mr. Merlin, Mr. Merlin. I do. What was that? Dave, it was way yeah, Mr. At the Merlin, Mr. Merlin, yep. Mr. Merlin, oh. which was a sh short-lived series, and I remember going to getting cast in that, going, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, because it was also <laughs> my first television thing. I was just scared out of my brain in that one. I was just so nervous because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Um. 
And then Night Rider was probably the second thing I did. And that was more fun. Um, so you Hoff, might. you know, he David, David Hasselhoff was super, super cute and super nice to me. Oh, that's awesome. And it, everybody was super nice on that show. It and was, you, it was. You got uh, to sit, you were able to sit in Kit. I mean, who can say they did that, you know? I know. I was um, really, well, of course, we all knew Knight Rider by that time. And that was really fun to see how they, they figured all that stuff out. And yeah, that was, that was probably one of the highlights of doing that show, um, aside from David Hasselhoff. He was yeah. very cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was, was it a dummy car or was it a, a true car that you sat in or, or what was it? It was a real car. Yeah. So do I have to give away the secret? Cause I can tell you how. It if, was good. Oh, I would love to hear the secret, man. I loved, I love Knight Rider. <laughs> yeah. Knight Rider was great. It, the drag is when you give away the secret, then you watch for it every time. So I don't know if I should give it now. I, I want I want to hear the secret. What do you give me? <laughs> I'll give you the link to the episode. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's some blackmail going on here <laughs> and so what they do so in the the driver's seat it's a bucket seat right with a high back and and um there's actually somebody sitting in the bucket seat it's kind of wide and and they have sort of a the, at the you know back of the headrest they you, they can see through it so they could they drive it that way somehow oh oh interesting okay isn't that cool that is cool because i never quite understood how they did that so, so thank That's you. That's how they I'll, did it. So it was, yeah, you, you will send me the I'll link. I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. <laughs> that is really cool. So it really was a car. Yeah. And somebody really was, I mean, it really functioned and it did all the talking and the flashing and all that stuff. It was, it was fun. It was really wow. super fun to be in the show that I was very familiar with. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, Holly, very Hollywood, you know, <laughs> for one of my very first shows there. Let's, let's talk about one of my favorites. Um, ever since, I, I don't know how old I was. I think I was six when I saw Night of the Comet. And uh, it was a favorite of mine to go to because it wasn't truly a horror movie. You know what I mean? It right. was fun. Mm -hmm. I was able to laugh at a lot of the scenes when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. I remember one time my dad and brother and I were camping and I was rushing them to get home because Night of the Comet was going to be on TV that night. And I wanted to watch mm. it. I was going to set the VCR Aww. this time so I could record it. So I can have it permanently. Nice. So that's nice. my little behind the scenes of the movie. I, I, I love Night of the Comet. So um, tell me about that. Was was that just a basic audition for Night of the Comet? Well, night, I had done um, The Last Starfighter previous oh. to Night of the Comet. Yeah, they came out the so... same year. I was wondering how they were filmed. Which one was first? Yeah, uh, The Last Starfighter was first. Um, yeah, The Last Starfighter was like in the summer or, yeah, something like the summer. And then Night of the Comet was close to Christmas. So, um, so again, you know, you build up your resume. And I'd been on Days of Our Lives for a while. And so I had a little bit of cred by then. And I believe that I was asked, I wasn't asked in for like the first level of auditions like with the casting director or something I came in I believe it, it's been a long long time but I don't remember having a first audition but I'm being paired with uh, another actress and um for my sister and uh and reading with her and then Kelly Maroney was reading with another girl for the role of the big sister or Reg in this case um and um uh, when I was told that I got it, I I thought, you know, I was going to be, um, I, I, I was asked to come to the studio. We, they were going to do a photo session uh, that, you know, there's photos of, of Kelly and I and and dad and stuff like that. So they they cast us and then they went to this photo session so that they could have it part of the props. And we showed up there and we sort of were, were like, oh, it's you got the role. OK, uh, because we were cast. You know, we I, when we auditioned, we were auditioning with people that were more our types. Okay. And so it was sort of weird that mm. we were cast together because she's very blonde and we don't really look like sisters. Yeah. But, 
but I think it worked out. I mean, a lot of so. siblings don't look like their siblings. <laughs> no, so, but... I'm, I'm six foot four. My brother's like five foot nine. So. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me, Wowie. <laughs> I heard the other actress, this could be totally wrong, was Heather Lingenkamp. Is that is that right from Nightmare on Elm Street? Um, that's what I have read as well. Okay. I, you know, I well, didn't, I wrong. mean, I read. I mean, she would have been young too. It would have been before Nightmare on Elm Street. So before she was well known. Right. I think that um, she got Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Elm Street around the same time. Okay. So it was like she was up for this and that at the same time from what I've read. But at the time, I didn't know who she was. And, no. and honestly, I didn't know after the fact either until I read that that's who it was wow. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and I, I, you know, she looks she looks like what I recall the actress looking like okay. that I would so make, it makes so, sense that it probably it probably was her it probably was her yeah I mean she might remember it's terrible <laughs> isn't it <laughs> I don't know it's, it's been terrible a, that been I'm like I don't time. know it's been a long yeah. time <laughs> and like you said she wasn't well known at that time no. and then you know you go you get busy and you go through your thing and you don't really think about the last audition or who you yeah. auditioned with and stuff and like you that. probably you probably see many audition rooms you know back then and many actresses waiting oh, yes. for the same role as you so it's kind of blends together oh, over yes. time yes <laughs> it surely does especially in those in the in those days when you know you're in your early 20s or whatever and you're just every movie and tv show has somebody like you in it so yeah. you're auditioning constantly so yeah they they do they blend yeah now tell me about the production of it um how in the world do they make la look so empty <laughs> Well, um, downtown LA on weekends and early mornings used to be back in the eighties empty. That's now weird. it's it's just it's crazy the construction that's going on yeah. down there for a ap giant apartment buildings. I mean, it's starting to look like New York, you know, downtown. But at the time, it was office buildings, banks couple of hotels so people would sort of come in for business meetings and then leave there wasn't a, a lot of residential stuff at all very 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 little maybe on the periphery and however sadly there was a fairly large homeless community there which it still exists but they're trying to like build up downtown LA it, it sort it. of mirroring New York in a way um, my husband and I were my husband's a diehard New Yorker. And, and I thought, well, and he doesn't like LA very much. I thought, well, let's look at apartments in downtown. Maybe he'll feel more at home, but it's still in the very early stages. And it's like these little kind of islands of residential mm. skyscrapers, you know, and then a block away is just not a great area. Yep. Um, but at that time, and we shot very early in the morning, like, Christmas morning or the morning after Christmas or something like that in downtown LA and it was empty wow. we didn't have you know the budget for like police to stop traffic or anything like that and apparently a little piece of trivia there in one of the scenes where I'm on the motorcycle you see a car kind of pull into an intersection in the background mm -hmm. um I, I've actually never been able to spot it. I kind of look for it every once in a while, but um, because, you know, there was one person driving downtown LA, but even the very last scene in the middle of the street and the, you know, DMK pulls up and all yeah, that other stuff, yeah. it was empty. <laughs> it was just completely so empty. That is so odd. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I guess you I could never, went never to... ever do that again. No, I never went to LA until I was probably in my 20s. So I guess I never saw it in that decade to see how mm -hmm. empty it was in the morning. Because now, like you said, you go there at four o'clock in the morning and there's traffic and, and, and uh, construction and everything. Mm, it's crazy now. Yeah. LA is a different place than it was in the 80s. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> now, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of motorcycle, was that you driving the motorcycle or did you have a stunt double on the motorcycle? Well, I was riding the motorcycle on the back of a trailer at oh. one point. 
Well, that counts. That counts. You're still balancing yourself. I'm sitting on it. No, I, I, um, I did not know how to ride a motorcycle, and motorcycles are very heavy. And yeah. I, you really need to know. You need to train or yeah. whatever. So yes, I the the motorcycle except for the part where it's close up of me and it's kind of looking up at me, yeah, the, okay. driving around and looking around going, what the heck? <laughs> um, that was, that was on the back of a, a flatbed trailer. Okay. Um, but all, all the other stuff was a stunt person. Cause it was very convincing. I, mean, I must say your, your stunt double, at least from a distance, you know, looked like you. Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. She was great. I, I don't remember her name either, but uh, no, she was wonderful. And she was like, you ever need a stunt person? I'm here. So had I been in a position or done more movies where I did lots and lots of stunts, uh, yeah. I definitely would have suggested her as a double. Sure. Yeah. And uh, what about the uh, girls who just want to have fun scene? I'm assuming that was in a <laughs> mall late at night or something. Yes. So um, it's a, it used to be a, a very popular mall in Sherman Oaks. It was called Sherman Oaks Galleria. Um, and they used it for other films as well, but they would shut it down for the night. And uh, well, of course they shut it down for the night. Whenever it closed, we yeah. would come in and um, um, it was, it was, the. It, I don't know which store it was exactly. I forget, but yeah, we set it all up. We shot everything in one night and got in and got out. Um, but they used it, they used it for several things like Valley Girl famously and uh, I don't know, maybe Kelly's movie, uh, that, uh, what was it called? That robot movie that she did. Um, it, it, so it's been used, uh, yeah, a lot. Yeah, I'm look, I'm it's, looking not, it's not, mm-hmm. I'm looking up right now. It says Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Valley Girl, okay. said, Night of the Com- Commando, mm-hmm. Back to the Future Part 2, Terminator 2, I knew that one. Um, mm-hmm. Phantom of the Mall, never heard of that one. Yeah, it, it was used a good amount of times. Yes, it was. Um, yeah, but it's not there anymore. They, oh, they sort of, it was an office building for a while, I think. And then and now it's just been completely redone and it's a mall again, but it's kind of outdoor. It's, it's just a completely different place. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can't go back and reminisce I, there anymore, I'm afraid. I, I miss the 80s, though. You know, I miss those malls and all the things of the 80s, you know? Yeah, malls can't even exist anymore. No, you know, ours, with all the online shopping. Yeah, ours. We, I live in Montana, and um, mm-hmm. ours has been doing pretty well up until COVID, and now they're they're mm. filing for bankruptcy right now. So. Mm. Yeah, it's too bad. It yeah. is. There was something sort of fun about going to the mall, but oh well. <laughs> hopefully, kids are finding new and inventive things to do with their their no. free time. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they are though. <laughs> <laughs> they're sitting at home on their little games doing I I all got, that stuff whatever i got three girls and i got two teenagers and that's what they do and i like, try to get them out and it's like pulling teeth to get them outside i raised a couple of kids kind of on the periphery just before all that stuff really really set in and i'm so glad i mean my son did have one of those games um honestly i I don't even remember what they're called. I mean, but we never got really heavily, heavily into it. Thank goodness. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's tough. I think it's tough for parents nowadays to try to keep the kids active and outdoors and, and yeah. you know, keeping their minds. I, I think there's something um, <clears throat> in a way beneficial about doing these, playing these games, you know, in some some way it exercises their, their, their brain, for but sure. But yeah, it's good to have a, a balanced kind yeah. of. Yeah, it's funny when I was when I was rewatching Night of the Comet. There's that scene where you guys go outside and, and you, you look at Sam. It's like, where's the kids playing? There, there's no kids playing. Yeah. It's Saturday morning. I'm thinking nowadays it looks like that now. You know, no kids are mm. playing anymore. Yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of not only the just being on the internet. But also, I think a lot of parents have a real fear of letting their kids just run around. I do. You know? I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. We grew up in Reno, Nevada as kids, and we just mm-hmm. ran around the city and our, on our bikes, you know, just like on ET or something, you know, just on our bikes, riding around Reno, around the casinos. Yeah, it's a whole different thing nowadays. Um, me too. I, I remember, well, I was a little bit older, but 
I guess in high school, but I would stay out all night and come. I remember one of the greatest feelings somehow. And I, I was a good kid. So it, my parents somehow trusted me. I don't know why, but <laughs> I'd be all out all night long the summer after high school or something or in between grade 11 and 12. And, you know, running home as the sun was rising, I, I just felt, I loved that feeling. It was just yeah. like this feeling of, ha ha. And yeah, but kids don't do that anymore. I don't think. No. Uh, yeah. It's I wouldn't let my kids do that nowadays, you know, back mm -hmm. then maybe, but no, I, I was the same way. You know, I was a good kid and I don't think I drank until I was like 19 or 20, you know? So I did the same thing as you to stayed out late night with friends and came home whenever I really wanted. And my parents never really questioned it. So it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, of course, it was like, you know, you have to be home by 11. Okay. And if okay. I wasn't, my mother was super strict. It was like, if you're five past 11, she'd be like, give you hell. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but um, yeah, it's it's too bad. I feel like all of us were so there's so much this news cycle that's constantly going on, and and every single thing that happens in the country is just blasted at you constantly. Yeah. It really creates a sense of fear, 100%, which is yeah. a shame. I'm yeah. I really try to encourage my family, my kids. You can't live in fear, you know. Exactly. Did I freeze? What's that? I, I, I said, did I freeze? I, my internet is your, bad. Your audio sound, the, the video's lagging, but the audio has been, audio has been great. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I apologize for that. It's, it's just, it's this place. It's I'm on the outer banks of North Carolina <laughs> and the, the internet is not very good here. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. At least the audio is working great. So I don't mind that whatsoever. Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, Last Talk. Okay, now, you said you filmed that before Night of the Comet. Um, mm -hmm. Was that a basic audition for Last Starfighter? Yes, that was more basic. Um, at the time, I was doing Days of Our Lives. So, mm -hmm. but, but I was auditioning for other stuff as well, you know, as I was doing Days of Our Lives. And I got this at, while I was still on that show. Um, yeah, it, I, it was just a regular audition you know, and then um, had a call back. And I remember um, I was paired with Lance wow. um, and, you know, everybody from that era, you know, all the really um, well-known kids, the Brat Pack or whatever audition mm -hmm. for it, I think as oh, well. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was uh, paired with Lance and we were both relatively unknown. I think he'd done Halloween. I think it's Halloween too. Yeah, before. I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, one of the Halloweens. So, you know, he was he 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 was great. He he was like very he's a very, very serious, you know, actor who wanted to be very prepared all the time and for every moment. I'm I'm a little more of a free for all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, woohoo. <laughs> But we sort of, he and I, when we were paired together, we sort of sat and talked about the characters a little bit. And then we went in and auditioned. And there was, um, you know, a, 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 I remember at one time, at one point, they said, okay, well, just like pretend you're at the lake and you're just lying there, you know, talking to your boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, so we sort of made it up as we went along, lying on the floor with the director and the producers in this little room. Um, so, but we had a really good chemistry, I think. And I also feel like they were interested in hiring kids that weren't as well known, you know? So the expectation, I don't know. I don't know what the mentality, maybe we were cheaper, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, I think it was, um, really great casting. I mean, Lance and I are still very good friends today. We have oh. such wonderful memories of that show. Uh, of course, Lance had a lot more to do in it than I did. So he has some great stories. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, like with, with work, uh, working with Robert Preston, et cetera. Oh, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was just a lovely experience. You know, Nick Castle was wonderful. I mean, it really did, as cliche as this sounds, it really did feel like a labor of love. Yeah. And we all really liked each other. And it just was a nice, it was just a really nice movie to be a part of. And I remember seeing it after the fact thinking, I, I, I could actually sort of 
remove myself from the character and sit and enjoy the movie, oh, which is unusual. That would be um, in it, yeah. So that was that was nice. I heard that initially it was going to be in the suburbs instead of the uh, RV park that it was in. Is that right? Apparently, I've heard that too. I don't know. Yeah. The, the script that I got was in the trailer park. Um, I think they wanted to uh, make it a little bit different from like other movies of that time that did take place in suburbia yep. you know and they like wanted yeah, exactly they wanted to just have something a little bit different so it couldn't be just automatically compared to something yeah. like that um and i think it was a great choice because it so. just it makes uh the characters a little more humble you know a little more bare bones um and maybe even uh more relatable in a way yeah you know Yep. Yeah, I love the setting of it. And it's just a cool look how each how there's different like RVs on different layers of the hills, you know, is it really cool looking? Yeah, I mean, that was a real RV park. Or, okay, you know, motor. What do you Yeah, I guess RV, RV park motor home. Or, yeah, or, I don't know. Yeah, yes, but it was a real one, but they dressed it up quite a bit. I, I kind of got a kick out of it. They sort of made it a little more cartoony, and very, very colorful, very colorful palettes and real characters, you know, in the trailer park. Trailer park, that's what I'm trying trailer to think park. of, yep. in the trailer park. Um, but I, I, yeah, they did a great job, I thought. And then, you know, Starlight, Starbright, that, that place on the top of the hill there still exists, apparently. Somebody oh, just sent me a picture of that recently. Wow. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, I think they did a really, really good job with the production design of that place. Yeah. I think so, too. I think it kind of, mm. to me, just, it stands out more than the space scenes, honestly. As, at least as a kid watching it, I just liked the, the aesthetic look of the uh, trailer park. Right. Yeah, me too. I thought it was great. And it was completely different from the outer space thing. And I think they probably wanted that contrast, mm -hmm. of course. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I thought it looked great. Yeah. At Nick Castle, the director, did you know going into it that he was Michael Myers? Is that something that was kind of known back then? Not to me. <laughs> I don't know if other people knew of it, but I have to say that genre of film wasn't really my cup yeah. of tea anyway. So even if he had said that, I would have been like, okay, I don't know what that means. But I it cracks me up. I remember hearing Nick Castle, you know, was, was the shape on Halloween. And now he's a director. It's like, what? The shape is a, is yeah. a director now? <laughs> right, 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 right. It, I guess he got that role sort of um, by chance. Uh, he was working on the film and they said they needed that person right. so I think so to stick this mask on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he did it, but it cracks me up at conventions. He's so popular yeah. because of that. And, and I keep saying to him, you know, we'll have a table together with uh, Lance and I'll say, this could be anybody. I could be say I was the shape for goodness sakes. He laughs. He's very, he's very cool and laid back. And, That's good. Um, and he goes to these conventions, man, and, and they love him because he was the first one. Yeah, and first one. he hasn't been doing conventions for very long, so he gets crowds of people. Oh, man. Speaking of conventions, are you planning on doing any um, coming up soon now that the uh, country is opening up? I, I don't have I'm not slated for any live ones coming up. I am doing something called Iconicon. Um, in mid July, okay. which is online. Okay. So look for that. Uh, I'm doing one with Kelly and then I'm doing one a couple of days later. It's the weekend of, I don't know, it's mid July, like the 13th or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, so Friday, I think it's Kelly and Sunday it's Lance. Oh. So doing two, two online convention days. But in terms of live conventions, uh, I don't have any plans yet. To do one of those now well hopefully soon when things get safer for you you can get yeah. out there and uh, meet the fans i know uh, and that's one of the great things about these conventions is uh is getting to meet some of the people that really enjoyed your movies you know and and it means so much i mean that's why we do them after all exactly now, i do have a couple weekend at bernie's questions i don't want to keep you much longer so we'll go through them kind of quickly um mm -hmm. i gotta say terry who played bernie Ever since I first watched it when I was like a teenager, I guess, um, amazed with how well he played dead. 
Like I can watch oh, the movie yeah. now and I'm trying to catch him breathing or something moving, but he doesn't budge at all. No. Yeah. I have a funny story about that. Actually. Uh, the day that they shot um, him, you know, being killed, <laughs> you know, he's sitting at his desk and, and then the boys come and discover the body, right? They think he's asleep and um, they discover him. That was a lot of the shots with Bernie or a dummy or whatever, you know, where it has to be, where yeah. it would be impossible to be alive doing those scenes. But this one, it, it was just him and he's sitting there, you know, slouched over. And um, Ted Kotcheff, the director, you know, they, I was, uh, for some reason I was there, maybe it was, we were doing all the interiors of the house or whatever. And um, I was watching them shoot the scene and, and they finished, you know, and Ted Kotcheff didn't say cut. He, he just kept, he went like this very quietly. <laughs> and poor Terry was sitting there, you know, and it was, it, it, they just were watching and waiting for him to like, <laughs> which eventually he did. It was kind of cruel, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> awesome. I, don't, I don't think they did that again, but yeah. I, and that may have been the first scene where he was at, that they shot where he was actually dead. So they were wow. kind of being hard on him. <laughs> yeah, but, he, uh, he was amazing. He, he is the standout role of the movie, honestly. Which is amazing because he's dead, dead. throughout the yeah. movie. Yeah. What a what a, a sign of a good actor. I mean, oh, you, truly, you have you have to uh, create a character that's dead that people want to look at. It, okay. it, you can't just be like that. You know, you no. can't just be dead. No. And and he did. He created something just in that weird little facial expression <laughs> when the eyebrow was up or whatever <laughs> it was he did made you not want to take your eyes off him yep, exactly um which is quite a commentary to uh to his talent yeah um i just watched him i mean he's such a talented actor anyway i'm i'm gonna, going to be involved with a little um film that has something to do with friday the 13th oh. uh, it's not a part of the the official thing okay. or anything but it's just well, it's just a short that a friend is doing um, but I just watched um, Friday the 13th, part seven. Yeah, that's right. He's the uh, psychiatrist or something, right? Yes. And he is so wonderful. I mean, <laughs> just the details and the mannerisms and yep. the expressions and everything that he does um, and what he brings to the character is just wonderful and um, very entertaining. He's such a talented actor yeah, yeah. and a lovely guy too, by the way. Oh, that's awesome. But now that I'm an adult, I'm watching Weekend the Bernies. All I can think of is when should rigor mortis, you know, set in? Couldn't he be <laughs> stiff by now after like two days of, of, of being dead? <laughs> Especially if there's a second movie. Shouldn't he be a little stiff by the second movie? <laughs> right, and in the second movie, he's dancing all over the place, isn't he? Yeah, you would think. You would think that... Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess they could, it's like a theatrical choice. You yeah, know? They exactly. Can, they can do whatever they want. So what keeps you busy these days? Anything coming up? I have been very busy, actually. I mean, I, with the pandemic, it gave me a chance to really focus on um, this script that I've been working on with a writing partner and a producer. Um we've been really working hard on rewrites and whatnot, and it's been optioned by a production company in Canada. Nice. So uh, that's been really occupying my downtime, which is great. Also, I, I want to kind of get into directing more and, and that the, the other side of the camera stuff. Um, so I've been, uh, they gave me an opportunity to really focus on that. Uh, I've got a play also that I'm, I'm, going to direct that I've been working on. Um, uh, so yeah, it's that kind of stuff that I've been, I've been doing most, re most recently, but now that things are starting to open up again, I feel like I'm auditioning all the time. Oh. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's great. People yeah. have, I guess, just sort of this backlog of, of uh, yeah. projects that yeah. they're, they're trying to get, get out there. So I've been auditioning for a lot of stuff for on camera. 
um, and working on this uh, personal project of mine. So I've been keeping very, very busy. And of course, podcasts have become super popular as yep. well. So I've been doing quite a few po podcasts. And thank you. Uh, for that. I mean, well, yeah, thank you for asking me. A Night at the Comet and uh, the Last Starfighter and Weekend of Bernie's are, you know, they're these retro movies that have a new life of their own. It's amazing. Yep. Um, and also, there's a lot of talk about, you know, doing a sequel for The Last Starfighter. Ooh, a sequel. That they, not, a, not a reboot? Yeah. Right. Oh, there was a talk. There was talk about doing a reboot, I've but now that. it's. Yeah, it's more a sequel, which is better because uh, Jonathan Betchel, the original writer, is involved. Oh, nice. um, I think I think Nick Castle is involved to a certain degree, and there's talk that Lance and I are going to come back as the parents of the next Last Starfighter. Oh. I I haven't seen a script or anything, yeah. but um, even Nick has spoken publicly about it. Wow. So it, it's exciting. a real thing. I know it's very very exciting. Well, all right. Thank you. I want to thank you so much. Big, huge fan of your work. This has been a pleasure and honor. And hopefully I can run into you someday at a convention. Yes, that would be great. I would love that. Um, yeah, we'll see. I don't, like I said, I have nothing on the books at the moment, but um, I'm sure something will happen in the next little while. Who knows? Yeah. But we'll see. But um, I look forward to meeting you. Same here. Thank you so much for your time. This has been really fun.